One of the most famous Linux analysis programs is the top program. It's built into almost every distribution of Linux, and I'm showing it here on my main workstation. Now, this I have modified and configured a bunch, and I'll show you how to do some configurations to the top program so yours can look more like mine if you want to. Okay, but for the moment, let's jump over to a virtual machine. This is a Debian Linux virtual machine with no configurations. And we'll use this and we'll configure this one and make some changes to it as we go. So if we were to type in what is top uh, using the what is command, it'll say, oh, top, that displays Linux processes. That's a very simple description for a powerful analysis tool. The top program does display Linux processes, but it does a lot more. So let's run the program on this system, just typing top, and you'll see it looks similar to my main system, just not as jazzy and colorful. Now you'll notice that the information is changing in real time. It's refreshing every three seconds by default. It does indeed show the CPU and RAM percentages for every process that runs. It also goes further in that you can terminate those processes individually by way of process ID. And that's mainly what I use top for, the analysis and the termination of processes. However, top does do more than just that. Okay, so let's analyze what we see here for a moment. The top section, no pun intended, is the system summary. Here we have uh, various rows of information, including tasks, the CPU, and memory. More on this section in a little bit. Below that, we have the list of processes, and we'll focus on this to start. I'm using an account called user. So the user account, very simply named user, that's who I am logged in as. You may see other accounts like root, and other system accounts working with the system and running processes, but we're gonna focus on our user account for now here. You'll also notice that there are process IDs, PIDs, one for each process running. So each process that's running gets a separate ID number, and that's what associates it with the system, and that's what we can use to uh, analyze it more and possibly terminate it if we need to. You'll also see that each process shows the amount of CPU usage and memory usage, and it's sorted by CPU usage by default. So the process that's using the most of the CPU will be listed first, but we can modify this. If you wanted to sort by memory, and the two are quite often close, but maybe not exact, um, if you wanted to sort by memory, you could do capital M, and then you'll see that our sorting has changed here a little bit. Now we're sorted by percentage memory. You could also sort by PID, by process ID, by doing a capital N like Nancy. And you'll see that the highest process ID number is listed at the top. You can also sort by time if you wish to with a capital T. And so the program that's running the most or has been running for the longest is sorted at the top for time. And to get back to CPU, you do a capital P for processor. So lots of options there for sorting, and that's really just the beginning. So try it out on your system, open up the top program and analyze your system and see what you have in there and try to identify the different components. Now, if you have a problem opening top, uh, you could do a couple things. You can do a where is top, and by using the where is command, you'll see the path to that program if it exists on Linux. And it does here. It's within slash USR slash bin. Now, if it's somewhere else, you could type that path, whatever that path name is, and then top to run it. And then, of course, you could add it to your path variable if you needed to, to have it run automatically just by typing the top command. But usually this is not an issue on almost all Linux distributions. It is stored in slash USR slash bin, and you just type top, 
to run it because slash USR slash bin is already in the path. All right, so let's talk a little bit about CPU usage. So I'm gonna jump over here and I'm gonna start up this video here and we'll go back to our top program that's running in a separate terminal. And we'll see that, oh, Firefox is using a ton of CPU power. It's up at 54.5% and hovering around that. So a lot more than before, and that's because it's running that video. So um, Firefox is using a lot more bandwidth on the network. It's using more CPU and GPU power because videos do that type of thing to your system, especially when you have a virtual machine like this. Now you may say, well, Dave, you're, you're getting close to 100%. I mean, look, you got 55, 58, you got 21, 11. But what you have to keep in mind is that you have more than 100%. You actually have 100% CPU power per core. To see all the cores on your system, press the one key and that'll show all the cores on here. So for example, this system has zero through three, so it has four cores. So it's a virtual machine with four cores. So really our maximum CPU power is 400%. Sounds like some crazy sci-fi movie where we just bend all the rules and math gets thrown out the window, but that's how it works in Linux. So every core gets 100% and we are currently using 58% and that's being distributed amongst the four cores. If we jump back to my main system here, you'll see I have CPU zero through CPU 11, so 12 cores. And in reality, these are not cores, they're actually threads because this physical system is a six core system that uses multi-threading two threads per core, so really it's 12 threads. And that's what we're seeing the CPU percentage for for each. But quite often you'll hear it referred to as cores, and even in virtualization systems, when you build a virtual machine, it'll say, how many cores do you want? I said four, and that's what we're showing here. So you're gonna hear both terms used synonymously. So if you go back to my main system here, this system actually has a maximum of 1200%. That's the maximum we could use here. And look what's running. We got OBS for recording videos at 200%. We've got Kimu, that's KVM, which is running my virtual machines. That's at 100% because I'm running this virtual machine within the system. So it's busy over there, but not too bad because uh, you can see we're only hovering at about 25 or 30% amongst all of the CPUs. When you're done, you can just press the one key again to remove those additional displayed CPUs, and then it just shows the average for all of them here. Now you also have total memory and memory used listed in here. So you'll see that we have what are called mebabytes, which are essentially the same as megabytes. Um, and you can see that we have basically eight gigs of memory and that we have 5.8 gigs available. Free is 4.3 gig, but we have uh, cache memory that we can use. So the total available memory on this virtual machine is 5.8 gig. So that's one of the things that I'm gonna check uh, quickly on a system when I start working on a new system. What is the total memory and what is the available memory? What's the free memory here? And also what's the situation with CPUs and of course the processes. Now, it may get a little confusing, MIB, Mebabyte, but essentially, if uh, we open up a calculator here, we can do uh, gnome-calculator, our built-in gnome calculator, go to advanced mode. If you're dealing with megabytes, a megabyte is going to equal uh, one million bytes. Now, some people will say, okay, we have megabytes in RAM, but in reality, that's not how it works. It's actually mebabytes. That's the appropriate term. And that's what top uses. Mebabyte, a mebabyte will actually equal 1,048,576 bytes. So what's the difference? If you have a megabyte, that's actually working in the base 10 system. 
So you would do 10 x to the y, and so it would be 10 to the sixth power, which equals 1 million. But if you're working in mebibytes, which is the proper terminology for memory and RAM, then you're going to be working in the base 2 system. And so that would, uh, mebibyte would be 2 x to the y and 20. So 2 to the 20th power, which will equal 1,048,576. So keep that in mind. Um, that's just another thing to think about when you're dealing with top. Top is in mebibytes. But they're so close and it's so similar and people use the term synonymously uh, quite often anyways. In fact, I just said it before. I said we have 8 gigs but I should have said eight gibs, <laughs> but whatever. You get the idea there. And now you may say, well, Dave, this is showing mebibytes. I don't really care about mebibytes. I care about gibibytes. Okay, that's cool. You can change that. Do a capital E on your keyboard, and that'll change it to gibibytes. Capital E again, change to tebibytes, pebibytes, exabytes, and back down to K, and back up to M, and we'll leave it at G, gigabytes. That's generally how I'll set up my system. Now, if we quit out of here, you could also start top in a certain way. You could start it with whatever options you want. And so this is one example. You could do a dash capital E and specify G for gigabytes. When we do so, it starts it with gigabytes instead of the default mebibytes. And in fact, you could save this configuration. So let's do that. Let's save this. And also, I like to show all of the CPUs. So I'm going to press the 1 key. And to save this, just press the capital W. And it says, wrote the configuration to the top RC file. So now, if we quit out and we run it again, you'll see that not only is it showing gigabytes, but it has all of the CPUs open. So now it's getting more similar to my main system here, where we're showing gigabytes and all the CPUs open in the beginning. Cool. Oh, and one other thing, uh, you can see all of the memory being used for a particular process. That's actually showing uh, very big numbers, which may or may not be helpful to you. If you just press the lowercase e, the lowercase e will then show you mebibytes and then up to gigabytes tebibytes, petabytes, and back down to kibibytes. Um, I usually like to show this as mebibytes. It's a little bit easier to read, makes more sense to me. Okay, Firefox is using, you know, 196 uh, mebibytes of RAM or whatever. So I'm going to save that too with a capital W. And now let's get into some troubleshooting with top. So I primarily use top to analyze the system and terminate processes that are not behaving. So we still have this video going on and it's using a ton of CPU power. Let's say for some reason that video and thereby Firefox was to freeze up and cause the system to hang. And I'm pretty sure that that's the guy that's causing it to hang. Let's say it was showing 100% CPU usage altogether and it wasn't changing from that number. And the system, either Firefox was frozen or the whole system was having issues. Uh, and let's also say that I can't close Firefox by Xing out or doing uh, an Alt F4 or whatever. Well, we could terminate the process from here. To do that, we can press the K key, K for kill, and then specify the process ID number that we want to terminate. Now, by default, it's going to pick up the process that's using the most CPU power. You'll also notice that the refreshing has stopped while we run this. Um, so it will, by default, if we press Enter, uh, terminate 14431 and here is that process id that is firefox so if we press enter for this it'll say oh okay let's send a sig term that's a standard termination of the process it's a graceful shutdown of the process and that's known as the number 15 signal if this were to fail we could change it 
to something like the number nine uh, signal if we wanted to. Uh, number nine is a true kill, which is an ungraceful termination. So if 15 doesn't work with a graceful termination, uh, then number nine we would move on to. But usually 15 will work for you. So I'm just going to press enter because that's the default. And give that a moment. And that closes down Firefox. If I hit my super user key, you see Firefox is no longer here. Oh no, I can't watch the video anymore. Well, uh, that's not why we're here. We're not here to see the Rangers win. We're here to see top in action and terminate processes. Again, careful with that because if you use the number nine, uh, that could cause other issues on the system. Whenever you do an ungraceful termination, it could be detrimental to the system. So a number 15, a SIG term is the better way to go. Now, in some cases, when you do terminate processes, you may need to reload your desktop. And you can do that with an Alt F2 and then run the restart command. So you may need to do that. Uh, it depends, and not all desktop versions or modes will allow that, but you may need to do that sometimes. Now, in the case that you cannot find uh, the process, if it's not listed for some reason, you can't find it, you can search for that process and filter it out from the list. Because this list may be longer than what we actually see here. If I press the uh, page down key, we're going through all the process, uh, processes on the system. So you see there is a lot. You can page up and page down between those. So it may be that you want to filter out for a specific process. So let me bring Firefox back up here. That will now run. Okay. All right, so Firefox is up. But it's not really doing much of anything. Let's say it was buried in the list here. I could search for it and filter out this list to show it. And to do that, I would press the O key. And you see that we have a filter option show up here. And then we could type in command in all caps equals and the process name that we want to grab because every process that's running is really just a command. It's a program, it's just a binary that's running. You could run this by way of command in the terminal. So that's what it's showing. Command is kind of synonymous with process. So we would do command, all caps, equals, and the name of the process we wanna find, like Firefox-ESR, which is the name of the Firefox browser on Linux. You could abbreviate that too. You could just type in fire and it'll probably bring it up because there's probably nothing else on the system that has the name fire. Press enter and there you go. It filters that out and shows Firefox-ESR. So that may be easier. You know, it could be something that isn't really using much in the way of CPU power. Maybe it's using a lot of memory power. Uh, who knows? But it may be buried in the list but you may have an idea if it's something that's frozen up here. You may say, oh, that's got to be it. Let's search for that because I don't know what the PID is. Filter it out, and then we could say, ah, okay, that's the guy. So we could either terminate that process. Uh, we could press K, and it'll say 1490 as a default. No, I don't want that. I want the Firefox one. I'm going to say 22603. Press Enter. And we'll use uh, 15 once again as the standard. Press Enter. And that should get rid of it in a moment. All right. To remove the filter, just press the equals sign. And you'll get your regular list of processes once again. Awesome. Let's go to another terminal here uh, to see. Actually, let's open a third one just for giggles. And to see all of the options for working with the kill command, you can do kill dash L. And so the kill command in the Linux prompt is the same as running kill in top. In fact, that's where top gets it from. If we do a kill dash capital L, we'll see all the different um, termination signals uh, and other signals that can be sent. All right, so here's 15, signal termination. That's a graceful shutdown of a particular process. And here is nine, signal kill. That is a true kill and an ungraceful 
uh, shutdown of that process. Now, for working with processes, uh, you can also do this in the command line if you need to terminate something. So the command line way to do this would be first to find what the process ID is and then kill it with the kill command. So previously, I ran the GNOME calculator here in another terminal. That does not fork, so it's still running off of this terminal. And you can see the program is open here. So in my third terminal, I'll say, okay, I need to know what that PID is. So we could do a PS aux. So that's PS command AUX. Normally that would show all processes that are running, but we could pipe that and filter it with the grep command and say something like calc, because I know it's GNOME calculator and I know calc is in the name. Press enter and we see it here. Here is GNOME calculator. It is actually process ID 22102. And then we could go ahead and kill that by way of process number 22102. Uh, press enter for this, hit the super key, and you can see the calculator is gone. So that indeed did work. Linux gives no written results. This is the way. However, top allows you to do all this and analyze the processes in real time in one window. So that's one powerful reason to use top. Now you might find that top refreshes too quickly or too slowly. Sometimes you might want it to refresh faster. You could press the D key, D like Dave, or delay, and change it from three seconds to say one second. So if we press enter now, you'll see that it's going to refresh every one second. And if you like that, you can write it to your configuration with a capital W. Good. But now let's just have a little bit of fun before we end the video, and we'll get into a little color configuration. So top is no exception to color. You can add color in the terminal like crazy. So we can do that in top. If we press capital Z on the keyboard, that'll bring up the color mapping window. And it gives you kind of a default here, but you can modify this as you see fit. There are four different elements. There's summary data, which is at the top. Then there's messages or prompts, which come up as the message like when we filtered by command name or process name. You have the column headers like PID and CPU percentage, and then the task information, which is the actual tasks or processes that are running. So you can pick any of these, and then you can select a color based on this between zero and seven. So if I wanted to modify the task information, I could just do capital T and then select a number like two for green, okay? Um, then I could change the uh, summary data by capital S, and we'll say four for blue, or let's do five for magenta. The column head is capital H. We could leave that as yellow or maybe cyan. And then for the uh, nasty message, the messages and prompts, I will usually keep that as red. And then when you're done with this, uh, you need to commit it. So we can press enter. There's actually more to this. You can actually uh, make color configurations for four different viewpoints of top that gets a little bit beyond, but, um, and I don't normally use that, but for this, we'll press enter to commit it and end. And now you can see our new, uh, color scheme. In addition, uh, to show that red, let's say I wanted to filter, I can press O and you can see, okay, adding filter. And then any messages where it sees something wrong with the system will show up there in red as well. Lastly, I would save all this with a capital W. Yeah, first we have to escape out of here, but capital W to write the configuration to our top RC file. Now this file, it could be stored in your root directory, you would see it as a dot top RC, but more often than not, it is in the dot config slash proc PS uh, directory. If we look inside there, you see it top RC. If we run a vim on that, 
you'll see a converted configuration file. This is not meant to be modified statically. You're not supposed to manually modify this. Uh, when you work in top, it takes care of modifying this for you. But the reason I'm showing it is because uh, after you've made all your configurations and you've got your nice settings here now with the colors you want and everything, and you can go way beyond this, by the way. But once you've got all this set, if you wanted to copy this over to another Linux system, you can easily do that. Just grab that top RC file and drop it onto the other system. Copy and paste it on. And uh, that is a great way to just move configurations quickly from one Linux system to another. All right. So awesome work. That is top. And we'll go back to my main system here. And you can see it's pretty similar, uh, fairly similar to what we have. That's pretty much how I'll set it up. Uh, obviously, there's a lot to top, more than just listing processes. In fact, it's a bit daunting how much top can do and how much it can be configured. So for more information about that, while you're working in top, you can press the H key and that'll bring up the help file that shows all of the keystrokes that can be used in top. And so, for example, we used D for the delay time to change the refresh. We used uh, uh, several others of these, Z to change the colors, uh, O to uh, do filtering, and so on and so on. That whole listing is here. And we can press Q to get out of there. In addition to that, you may be interested in the manual file. You can type man top and that'll give you the manual file for top just keep in mind that this thing is massive just look at the table of contents the table of contents is huge there's a lot you can do with this and a lot to learn and uh, some fun stupid tricks at the end as well but as you go through this you're going to see there is a ton of ways to utilize it just with the keyboard and do all kinds of shortcuts and all kinds of filtering and uh, it is very in-depth. Let's just leave it at that. Press Q to get out of that manual page. However, there's also some alternatives to top that you might be interested in. And uh, so I'm actually on my main system here and I'm running Tilex, which is a terminal multiplexer. And you can see I have top on the left. On the right hand side, I have another program called HTOP. Let's go full screen on that. And you can see that this shows your commands in kind of a tree view here. Uh, but it looks fairly similar. You have your process IDs, you have your uh, CPU and memory, and then you have the information on top. So uh, some people like this for the view, but some people like it just because of how it can do filtering and searching. And you can see there's function keys on the bottom for all of those. So that is H top like H like helicopter, so H top. And if we go to another screen here, you'll see I have some other stuff running. On the left, we'll go full screen on that. This is actually known as the bottom program, which is run with BTM. So bottom is another nice one that you might like. It shows CPUs, core temperatures, disk status, processes, of course, network activity, memory, and so on. So you might be interested in that. In addition to that, we have BTOP. BTOP. Now, this is, uh, the terminal's too small, so I have to maximize that terminal. But this is what BTOP looks like. And I actually use this a lot. I use TOP and BTOP the most. This one has the CPU percentages. Then it has the temperatures for the CPU. Uh, you've got your processes, you have networking, you have disk information and memory. So another program that I'll, want, I'll run uh, quite often. And then you have uh, GUI based stuff as well. For example, GNOME system monitor. This is a GUI based version. It's very similar to top. It's kind of like the task manager in Windows. You might also like uh, K-SysGuard. 
which is another system monitor program. Again, very much like Task Manager in Windows. So another couple options there. But the ones I use the most, definitely BTOP, and then also regular old top. There you go. For more information, uh, there's a corresponding article to this on my website at prouse.tech, and that link should be below this video. Check it out, and feel free to subscribe at any time. Hope you enjoyed it, and hope you learned something from the video. Take care now.